of the two issues that seem to be most prominent in relation to future developments around digital agriculture, I, I guess the last session reinforced to us that access to telecommunications uh, is a fairly important one. Uh, the other one that comes up quite frequently is the whole issue of um, uh, data ownership and, uh, and those sorts of issues and, and perhaps even extending into privacy. Um, but there is a wider issue there as well in that um, some of these technologies are obviously um, potentially useful or usable in issues like uh, compliance with regulations, etc. Um, so the, the, the understanding of the legal implications and um, some of the legal issues around uh, digital information and data is, is obviously quite important in understanding how these um, technologies might develop into the future. So this session, we've got three speakers who are um, either familiar with these issues from a legal perspective or involved in some of the applications where these types of issues emerge. So um, our first speaker is uh, Peter Leonard, who's a partner in uh, the Gilbert and Tobin law firm, and he heads their media and data protection practice. And uh, I'm sure Peter will give us a, a very interesting presentation or discussion on some of these issues to start us off. So please welcome Peter. Thanks, Mick. Um, you've got me on one of my anti-PowerPoint um, days, so um, uh, you only get me. You don't get pictures to look at or words to read, but uh, hopefully I can be a little bit entertaining and uh, keep you focused. Um, I'm a lawyer and I'm here to help you. Um, so, uh, but, but perhaps I should say um, the least helpful thing that I can say to start with and get it out of the way um, which is that um, that data that you think you own, you probably don't own. And um, I want to spend a bit of time unpicking that concept because it's a really important concept to grapple with and then deal with uh, through contracts uh, in the way that um, farmers deal with data. I've worked with data for about... 30 years now, um, uh, almost all of my legal career, um, and it started back in the days when uh, data was um, green, green screen technology in uh, trading rooms of banks uh, back in the 1980s, uh, getting a feed of information from uh, Reuters or Telerate, and that was all proprietary information delivered um, uh, to proprietary terminals. And then along came a guy called uh, Mike Bloomberg, um, who later become, became the mayor of New York, and completely blew that industry away, basically through uh, open data. Uh, and what Mike Bloomfield did was um, remove the need for the green screens, enable uh, traders to use PCs, and through those PCs to integrate the data feeds of multiple service providers, um, Telerate, um, uh, uh, then Reuters uh, and Bloomberg, and then ultimately um, competed on the basis of an open system um, on, the, on the quality of the Bloomberg data feeds. Now, what is interesting about 30 years ago and today is that the issues around the ownership of data really haven't moved significantly in the last 30 years. And to the extent that they have moved, they've moved adversely to people who create data. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the law has been pretty good at protecting copyright um, really since uh, almost uh, William Shakespeare's day. And what copyright protects is creative input by humans to create something tangible that reflects their creative endeavour. That might be a play, or in modern times it might be a film and so on. 
Um, but data, on the whole, is not particularly creative. And to the extent that data is captured nowadays in many applications, it's captured not through uh, human interaction, but through or through human creativity. Uh, it's captured through human cre creativity as employed in software that is then used to capture the data. And uh, the law is pretty clear. Well, um, software is protected by copyright, just like uh, other creative works are. But once the human has applied that creativity, the data and the data capture is captured by the software, not by a human. There's no human author. And one of the most fundamental rules of copyright is that it only protects um, the output of humans. And the output of the humans was the software, not the data. So data uh, on its face usually is not protected as property uh, in law. It's not like the tractor. It's not like your paddock. It's not like the wheat standing in your paddock. You own all of that. It's not like what you write in your notebook, um, which is your copyright work. The data that is generated in the course of the operation of your farm generally is not protected as a species of legal property. Well, that sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But let's not forget that there are um, two other ways in which things that aren't property are protected in the world that we live in. Uh, one is contract, uh, and basically um, because we come from an Anglo-Saxon world, world where English men, as they once were, could contract to do just about anything really that wasn't illegal, um, including slavery, until it became illegal. Um, you can agree by contract whatever you like, um, subject to some um, uh, broad rules uh, around uh, things being contrary to public policy. And the other thing that the law has done is developed a whole lot, bunch of principles around the protection of confidential information, or as it's sometimes called, trade secret information. And what the law does there is say, well, if you tell somebody something in circumstances where it should be clear to the person that you're telling that the information is confidential, the law won't just stand by and let that other person take the benefit of the confidential information that you created. But for the law to intervene to help the person that created the confidential information, firstly, they have to prove that it was confidential, and secondly, they have to prove that it remains confidential. Because the second that it goes into the public domain, that is, becomes generally known, it ceases to be confidential information and therefore ceases to be capable of protection under the law of confidential information. And really what the law of confidential information does is not give anybody rights of ownership, but it gives people that create confidential information a right to claim the confidentiality uh, against others that might take the benefit of that confidential information. So it does give some, uh, some benefits uh, for dealing with farm data that I'll talk about in a minute. But the other thing I wanted to, do, to talk about um, to slay a sort of another dragon of a misconception is around privacy law because uh, a lot of people think that personal information is owned by them. Um, that's not how privacy law works in this country at all. Um, personal information is owned by whoever collects that information um, to the extent that anybody can own it at all. And that gets back to the conversation again around is it capable of protection by copyright, is it confidential information. But most particularly, what privacy law does is give people the right to know how and where personal information about them is collected and how that in information about them is then used and disclosed. 
And that's a right that's given to human beings. It's not a right that's given to cabbages, raspberries or oysters. So um, personal information is only relevant to information about human beings and their activities. It can include information about business activities. It's not just personal information. So it's not what goes on in the bedroom or the kitchen. It can also be what goes in, on in the study or the field. But it has to be in information about an individual. Um, and of course, in many farms, uh, that's fine enough because many farms are run by individuals. Um, so privacy law is of some relevance to um, farm data and uses of farm data. It's, as Julia Gillard once said, in relation to sexism, was it? It's part of the story. It's not all of the story. It's, um, it's not none of the story. Um, so um, personal information is relevant, but at, at the heart of the discussion around uses of farm data should be a discussion around uh, who controls data and is there clarity provided by contract as to who can use what data um, rather than some abstract argument about who owns data. And discussions around who owns um, data often are really discussions around is it clear to everybody involved in the uh, information handling ecosystem, sorry to use that word, farmers and biologists, the only people who use ecosystem right, but um, it's been appropriated by information people as well. Um, but uh, what is necessary is that there's absolute clarity around uh, who has what rights to use what data uh, expressed in really clear terms that everybody understands, rather than relying upon words like ownership, which often mean nothing for the reason that I said, or even relying upon broad clauses about confidential information because often when you pull it apart, um, some uses of the data will be regarded as confidential or some disaggregations of data. For example, at the farm level, um, farmers rightly regard as confidential sensitive information about their farming practices, but aggregated up to an area level, um, many farmers couldn't give a damn. So um, it's not good enough to say information is confidential information just because it comes from a farm without clarifying in what form that data as it might be used or disclosed is confidential and what form it isn't. So all of these things can be dealt with by clarity and transparency. Now, so why is there so much uncertainty? Why is there so much angst, particularly in the US, around farms and uh, data? Well, the answer, of course, is like it is in many areas of law, that it's in the interests of some vested interests to create uncertainty and doubt about who owns what or who controls what and to make life more complicated um, than it really should be. So uh, if you read, um, with all respect to John Deere, um, a John Deere um, contract, um, you'll find the clauses in there about data pretty incomprehensible. And that's not um, only because they're drafted by American lawyers who like to draft clauses that are incomprehensible, um, but because um, there is obfuscation going on about who owns what. Uh, and um, that um, is because there's uncertainty in the law about who owns what, and they really don't want to close it down by a clear statement of uh, who can do what in relation to which data in which, which forms at which time. My view is that in Australia, um, we've got a number of things going for us. One, uh, we uh, have a legal system where judges expect clarity. We have a legal system where clients expect lawyers to communicate to them in plain English and to explain things in a way that normal, sensible human beings can understand. So um, it's not like the US where if you draft a contract, 
uh, from first principles saying things like they are and you take it to court some crazy judge who was elected by some crazy people um, says that's not in the form that those clauses usually are so it doesn't give you the protection you want. In Australia you'll go before a judge who looks at the words and tries to give them business effect. So I often say to my clients that um, less words are better than more words and let's just get real clarity here about uh, who is doing what, who's responsible for what and uh, in what circumstances. Now it's become more and more important uh, as we move to the Internet of Things worlds because let me go all the way back to what I was saying about 30 years ago when um, uh, the traders used to uh, connect up to the fire hose of um, Reuters information that was connected to their green screen. So in that world the data came really all the way from the, um, the exchanges of origin, the ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange as it then was and the New York Stock Exchange went into the Reuters system, passed through the Reuters pipes and came out the end at the Reuters screen. If something went wrong, you knew who to sue. It was Reuters. Um, the only question was, you know, had the input data that had come from the exchange been wrong, then Reuters might have a defence in respect of they were fed the wrong information, but after that point it was all governed by a Reuters contract with one party. We now move into an Internet of Things world where often the provider of the sensors is a different party to the party that runs the data analytics engine, which is a different party to the communications platform provider that connects it all up, uh, which is a different party from the party that develops the app uh, on which you look at the um, results from a data analytics application. And that they might all be a different party from the party that brings it all together, effectively the systems integrator, uh, and service provider to sell the service to you, the customer. So there's a whole bunch of people in this, I'm going to use that word again, information ecosystem um, who have to work together in order to deliver this service to you, the farmer. And of course lots of things go wrong when there are lots of parties involved because just through complexity you get into issues about, well, who's responsible for what um, who owns what, who can do what. For starters, your information that, you're, uh, uh, that is being input at the farm, either input by you or input through the sensor device automatically, is passing through this chain of parties, any, who, any one of whom might misbehave and um, tap off that data um, to use it for another application. So there needs to be uh, a contract structure that brings together those parties, that it brings clarity as between them as to who can do what um, uh, in relation to the data. So the complexity is not only at the farm level, um, the complexity is also um, just the nature of Internet of Things and the way parties work together in order to deliver um, data services to farms. And all of that needs to be addressed in a way that um, firstly the parties um, that are providing the service are happy with and understand uh, and the output of that then needs to be presented to the farmer in a way that the farmer understands. Now of course the other thing that happens in this world is that a huge amount of data is produced of which a small part of which is analysed. Um, I've heard different estimates but you know, one that I've heard is that less than 1% of the, the data collected in the world today is in fact analysed. I suspect it's probably a lot less even than that. Um, and all of that data is kind of sitting there <coughs> festering like a uh, potential asset or a potential liability. Uh, think of what that data might show for example as to links between uh, fertilizer use and um, cancer in food. Um, nobody's analyzed that data, the data is there. There may be liability issues arising through 
the existence of the data and the absence of analysis in respect of that data. And that data may also then subsequently turn up through subpoena or court process in the hands of um, some consumer advocate who wants to mount a claim that um, fertiliser causes cancer. So the issues around uh, legal liability, responsibility for data, what I call data-driven liability, are potentially uh, immense. And there are issues that appear all over the place. You know, the classic example is um, the driverless car, right? Um, you program a driverless car to avoid an accident, for example, um, running into the kid chasing the ball running across the road, but the programming diverts the car so it runs over the kid's dog, who it so happens is a pedigree dog um, who is about to win the dog show next week. Um, who's responsible? The person that provided the car, the driver, uh, the manufacturer, the software programmer, um, uh, or the driver of the car? Um, who knows is the answer. And um, that's an example of the kinds of complex liability issues that are starting to arise as, in essence, machines and automated decision-making processes through data analytics become more important across um, the broad range of activities in the economy, uh, including farms. And I raise it because I think you can get dazzled about the issues to deal around ownership and rights of use of data and not spend enough time thinking about the other potential sources of liability or liability exposure that arise through data that is captured but not necessarily analysed. And you can't even quantify that because almost by definition if it isn't analysed you don't know what you don't know. But um, there's always a risk when you have the information and you haven't looked at it um, that some plaintiff's lawyer down the track is going to, you can imagine the way to go in court, well, this data was available. Um, you chose not to look at it, didn't you, Mr. Um, service Provider? Well, no. Um, uh, with the money that we had available, we were trying to analyse this particular type of problem, solve this kind of problem and not look for problems that we didn't even know existed. Well, I put it to you that you were deliberately avoiding knowing that that problem existed. You can imagine the way it goes. Um, so that's going to be a big issue over the next few years and um, data analytics, data services contracts with farmers should deal with that issue, should make it clear um, who is liable for what for the unknown. And um, if your service provider is shying away from dealing with that question frankly with you, well, maybe you should be thinking about a different service provider or saying, well, let's have a straight conversation around this. So look, I'm not being critical of service providers in the market today. These are all brand new issues, um, uh, like many issues around the Internet of Things and this new data-driven world that we're moving into. Um, legal precedents in the past don't work. Um, but that said, um, the legal system is capable of dealing with all of this. Do I think there's a major problem around data and not being protectable as an asset in many cases? No, I don't think there is, because usually you can sort it out by contract and by using the law of confidential information. So I th do think the law of confidential information needs some tweaking and be made a, a bit clearer. Um, but what we need more than anything is some frank conversations around who's deriving value out of uses of data and fair allocation of value so that um, farmers know um, when their data is being collected, who's deriving the value and can have a engaged and sensible conversation about the division of that value. And um, that's the world that we move into. Thank you.